Hello everyone, my name is Malavika Nair and I'm a new research fellow at Emmanuel College. I'm a material scientist by training and my work is focused on creating improved material systems which can push and encourage the regeneration of human tissues. Today I'd like to share a very general background to this area of materials in regenerative medicine. And I'd also briefly like to touch upon some of my recent work and current research interests. So firstly, let's get started with what regenerative medicine is all about. When we think about the concept of regeneration, we're often thinking about the extreme ability to grow back entire limbs. And we often do see these in animals like lizards or axolotls, where they shed their tails but then grow them back really quickly in a matter of days to weeks. Trying to see this level of impressive regeneration in humans is sadly still limited to the world of science fiction. But although we are quite far from achieving dramatic changes, most, if not all, tissues of the human body are capable of regeneration to some extent. Of course, the degree to which they can do this does depend on the tissue that we're looking at. So, for example, if we were to take our skin, then the top layer peels off every couple of days and it reveals fresh, healthy skin. But if we then move on to the time taken for the bone or the heart to regenerate, this can be as long as 20 years, if not more. Mind you, these timeframes are still for healthy, non-injured tissues, and the rate of regeneration is typically much slower if we're looking at injured tissue. And throw in age, disease, and a variety of lifestyle factors, and we can really bring down the rates of regeneration and repair. Now, you might be wondering at this point what material science has to do with any of this. And the quick answer to that is that cells respond to various signals and changes in their environment. And the environment, of course, includes the materials that surround the cells. As a quick example, when we get a cut on the skin, the signals after injury often direct the cells to lay down new tissue. And this new tissue must be filled in rapidly and sometimes randomly so that we can fill in this gaping hole that's been created during the injury. But this often forms scar tissue and it's not what we really want. What we ideally want is the healthy, normal, native tissue. So what we can do is to try and understand, modify, and replace the injured tissue with appropriate materials which can help speed things along and guide regeneration in an appropriate manner. So if we want to replicate the signals that are found naturally within the body, then a good place to start would be to find materials that make up the native healthy tissue. The main structural protein in the human body is a protein known as collagen. Collagen comprises roughly 97% of our dry mass, and it's found in tissues that are completely different. So this can be the soft and squidgy cornea and cartilage, all the way to the much tougher and stiffer muscles, tendons, and bones. Collagen is what's known as a hierarchical protein. So that means that there's some sort of ordering and arrangement of the molecules into ever-growing larger and larger bundles until you get to your full tissue. The reason that collagen is able to create such different tissues with such different properties is because there's flexibility to change, to change its structure. So either the chemistry of the collagen at the very smallest molecular scale, all the way up to the way in which it's packed and stacked at the larger tissue scale. Now, because collagen is a building block of the material that packs around the cells, and because it can be modified so easily, it makes sense that it would be a great starting point for us as researchers to use in our regenerative materials. Much of my own work has been dedicated to understanding how chemical treatments and processing techniques that we apply in the lab can change the properties of collagen. Some of my work, for instance, looks at a form of chemical treatment known as crosslinking. Now it's named crosslinking because what this process does is to create links across various strands of a long chain. Collagen is a polymer, so it can be considered to be nothing more than a large bundled protein chain. Crosslinking is great because it allows us to improve the mechanical properties of the material, and so we end up with something that's much stiffer and much stronger. Chemical crosslinking involves a reaction, so it forms these bridges within collagen, or any material really, by using particular chemical groups on the material. So depending on the type of chemical crosslinking we use, we can change some other properties as well, especially if those chemical groups were involved in other, other functions. For example, as we mentioned earlier, cells respond to certain cues that are given by its environment. So to make a quick analogy here, we can treat ourselves as a cell and the collagen as a ladder. We can imagine these cues that the cells respond to and attach to as being the rungs on a ladder. 
Sadly, one of the most common crosslinkers used with collagen works by essentially connecting the rungs of the ladder together. So while tying the rungs of the ladder together does prevent the ladder from flailing about, it also prevents us from getting a proper foothold on it and climbing up and getting to wherever it is that we need to be. So the most common crosslinker that we mentioned before, EDC NHS, actually removes some of these cues, similarly, that cells can attach to and prevents them from getting to where they need to get to. But what if instead of tying up the rungs, we formed bridges along the side of the footholds? So now the ladder is still stable, but it can be used for its original purpose once again, which is to get from point A to point B. So as part of my research, I looked at identifying good alternatives for crosslinking and understanding what their influence is on a range of properties. So this doesn't just involve the mechanical stability of the collagen, but it also looks at the biological response, as well as other properties such as the distribution of electrical charge. In my current research, and over the next three years as gratefully funded by the Emmanuel College Research Fellowship, I hope to find new ways to modify the structure and chemistry of collagen in order to create smarter systems that can change the way that collagen behaves within the body. But this would be in response to a trigger provided outside the body. The hope is that such materials can be used in devices which can move and swell and contract and stiffen, all while still being able to guide the regeneration of tissues. So while we're still some ways away from growing entire organs, these systems could still be a great step towards mimicking our bodies a little bit better. But the fact that they can be controlled using external triggers means that even though we produce the same cookie cutter scaffold in our lab, we have a way to account for the differences between people or within a person over time to provide more personalized solutions to tissue regeneration. So thank you all for listening. And if anything I've said has piqued your interest, then feel free to get in touch or just leave a comment below and I'm happy to try and find a way to answer your questions as well.